Greetings to our valued RRS members. We are delighted to have you here. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Gail Wolishak and Dr. Catherine Held. The format for today will consist of an introduction from Dr. Wolishak, followed by the feature presentation by Dr. Held, and concluded with a Q&A session. Throughout the presentation, if you have any questions for the presenter or about the presentation, please post them to the right in the chat section, and they will be answered at the appropriate time. Next, I would like to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Woloshak. You may have seen her name registered in one of the countless inventions uh, in the field of cutting edge nanotechnology tools. They're on the forefront of imaging and treating cancer. Uh, as of fall 2018, she was appointed to the graduate school at Northwestern University as the associate dean for graduate students in postdoctoral affairs. We're very lucky that Gail was able to take time out of her busy schedule of Zoom video chats with her students and be with us here today. Uh, Dr. Wolschak. Thanks so much. It's really my joy to uh, introduce uh, Kathy Held. Uh, I've known Kathy for a very long time. In fact, we met when she was still at Mayo Clinic, and she's the person that introduced me to Radiation Research Society in the first place. So I, I have her to blame for it all, and but it's been such a joy. I owe her a lot for it. Um, she's uh, She moved from Rochester up to Harvard, Mass General, She's been there, still remains there, but a few years ago, she took on the presidency of the National Council on Radiation Protection. Um, she's doing a fabulous job there. I think it's really exciting the things that are going on. And today she's gonna talk to us about NCRP, what's in it for the RADRES members. Okay. Uh, thanks a bunch, Gail. Appreciate the nice uh, introduction, and and I uh, really am glad to have uh, Rad Rez ask me to do this to tell about um, a relative, a somewhat newer uh, direction in my life with uh, such an activity in and my activities at NCRP. So I'm a, a radiation biologist by training. As Gail mentioned, I've been in radiation biology research for a long time. I'm not going to tell you how long. And I have uh, really enjoyed that laboratory work and all the teaching and everything I did there. And, and about 15 years ago, I got involved in NCRP through um, serving on one of their committees. I barely even knew what it was before I started on that committee. And so it's really been a, a growth for me to be on that committee. And, and then on to the NCRP council and now as president. Mm to turn my video off so I can concentrate on the slides. So what uh, I want to tell you about today is uh, NCRP and really uh, about involvement for, of, NCR, of, of Rad Res members in NCRP because Rad Res has obviously been a really critical part of my life uh, as well as, as NCRP now is. So some of you are probably saying, so what the heck is this NCRP thing? Well, NCRP stands for National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurements. And many of you may recognize uh, this pie chart. Anybody who ever has had to attend radiation safety courses or has read Hall's textbook and read the radiation protection chapter always sees this pie chart. And this pie chart came out of an NCRP report published a little over 10 years ago. And of course, this is the important pie chart that shows that radon, I go back to the bigger one, radon makes up about a third of the background radiation, natural background radiation that, that we get here in the United States. But the really staggering thing when this report came out was to recognize that medicine now at that point made up nearly half of the back of the dose uh, of radiation to the average uh, in the United States. And so that was a big wake up call that led to a, a lot of changes in how we do and use radiation in medicine. And that's continuing to these days. So this is the sort of thing that NCRP does. Another example that many of you will be familiar with is many, many tables that you can see. And this one's maybe kind of small for you to see, but where you're told about dose limits that you got to memorize if you're ever taken in uh, uh, the radiation safety course, for example, at Brookhaven for work at NSRL, you got to remember some of these dose limits. So where do all these things come from? Well, they are recommendations that come from 
NCRP and our sister international organization, ICRP. And so there's a lot of, of history behind these recommendations. And those are some of the things that people who get involved in, in NCRP can be involved in. And I, I wanna come back to stressing, I'm stressing recommendations. We don't make regulations. We make recommendations to the agencies in the federal government who do make uh, actually the, the regulations. So what's NCRP? NCRP is uh, a council composed of up to 100 individuals. Uh, our predecessor organization, our founding organization is now 91 years ago. And uh, we became NCRP officially in 1964 when NCRP was chartered by Congress. And that congressional charter tells us that NCRP is to formulate and widely disseminate information, guidance, and recommendations on radiation protection and measurements. Uh, we don't get funding direct from Congress. We have to get all our funding from uh, agencies that uh, uh, give us grants and contracts to do specific jobs for them to make specific recommendations. And I'm gonna tell you about a lot of that as we go through. And one of the things that's really important is to recognize that NCRP is a nonprofit corporation and almost all of the work we do is done by volunteers. And this is where lots of our Rad Res members come in. And it's really important to keep in mind how uh, critical this volunteer cadre is to the activities of NCRP. We depend on you all and appreciate you all. So again, the mission to support radiation protection by providing independent, which is the critical word here, scientific analysis and information and recommendations. And so the federal agencies that come to us come to NCRP because they recognize that we act independently. We are not uh, biased by representing specific organizations and we base our recommendations on the scientific evidence that is available. Here's the structure of the NCRP. You can see we have up to 100 members. That's dictated by our congressional charter, but we're supported by emeritus members and consociate members. Uh, we have a board of directors and a bunch of committees that I'm gonna tell you about these PACs and our other committees in a minute. And we have collaborating and um, uh, other organizations, liaison organizations. Again, I'll come back to mention a few of those in a bit. Here's a more formal uh, chart that some of you may be used to, to seeing. Uh, we have a board of directors that runs the NCRP, our uh, staff and, and officers, and, and our seven PACs, program area committees, which are really the bread and butter. They do, do the work with the scientific committees that work under them within NCRP. So again, up to 100 individuals, were, uh, the uh, members are elected to six-year terms, and I need to stress that they're selected based on their scientific expertise. It, they're not selected to represent their employers or a, a professional organization or anything like that, and, and they Almost all are unpaid volunteers. Um, and these are the individuals, along with many others, who make up our program area committees, our scientific committees, and do the bulk of the work by serving on those committees and helping to prepare and, uh, importantly, to review all the documents that are created by NCRP. Our members are in all facets of expertise that are in any way related to radiation sciences. Um, so, so medical fields such as um, uh, radiology and radiation oncology and dentistry, as well as uh, risk analysis, emergency response, basic radiation biology, basic cellular biology, uh, really all sorts of expertise that we need to be able to fulfill the grants and contracts that we get uh, to make these recommendations. And as I've already said, um, Radiation Research Society members are a really integral part of NCRP. Uh, there are at least 30, I quit counting when I got to 30, 
Rad Res members who are NCRP members or emeritus members of NCRP, and many more Rad Res members who serve on, on our committees. Many serve in leadership roles, like Gail, who is head of our program area committee one, and I'll, I'll point out a few more of these as we go through. So there's lots of, of Rad Res involvement, and we're always looking for, for more people to get involved. And I'll tell you a little more about how you could do that if you're interested as I go through these slides. So what do we do? We give advice, as I've already said, and we typically do that through the various documents that we, we publish. And we now also are involved in some research, pre predominantly epidemiology and dose symmetry related to the million person study. And again, I'll get back to that in, in a few minutes. In the 91 years that NCRP has existed, we have published 184 reports. I was hoping I could change that to a five today, but the last report hasn't quite made it from the printer yet. It'll be out in the next day or two, I think. Uh, commentary statements are meeting proceedings. The last several years, they've been published in the Health Physics Journal. And then we also uh, have named lectures, which are usually published as as part of the uh, meeting proceedings. These are named le lectures at our meetings. So the bulk of the work gets done through our so-called program area committees. There are seven PACs that cover the gamut of all the kinds of, of work that, that we support. Uh, everything from basic radiation biology and epidemiology to operational radiation safety, uh, nuclear and radiological security and safety, medicine, uh, and so forth. And I'm going to tell you a bit more about each of these and our, our so-called council committees one and two uh, in a minute. All of our scientific committees are assigned under a PAC. Uh, some of them have come from ideas that PACs had. Some have come from grants, uh, requests from uh, federal agencies, and then we assign them to a PAC to oversee them. And at the moment, we have, uh, I think there's 10 on this list. This list needs to be changed every time I give a talk about NCRP because we're always finishing things up and having new committees start. Um, this one here for seven, for example, is the one that I am, we're waiting for the report uh, any day now to be published and then they'll go off this list. And we've got at least one more committee that we're in the process of getting put together. Um, Last year, what kind of things did we do? Well, we published four full reports last year in a wide variety of topics. Uh, one on dentistry, uh, one on radiation safety of sealed radioactive sources, uh, another one that was funded by NASA to make recommendations on space radiation that's relevant for effects on central nervous system, which is a very uh, big concern that NASA has for their astronauts right now. And uh, one on medical radiation exposure of pac patients in the United States. And that's the one that is updating that medical portion of the pie chart that I showed you at the beginning. And I'll come back to, to talk about that uh, a little bit more in a minute. We also published one commentary, which is a, which is a, a smaller, the commentaries are smaller documents than, than our reports generally and we had the proceedings of the previous year's meetings published. We have lots of sponsors. Uh, the size of each um, logo here is sort of proportional to the amount of money that, that we've received from those organizations over the years. So you can see that the Department of Energy, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, CDC and NASA have been our largest funders but a, a, a number of other government agencies have also, and, 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 and non-government agencies, uh, American Board of Radiology, uh, CRCPD, have also funded NCRP over the years or currently. So let me tell you a little bit more about some of the things that we've got going on. And while I'm doing that, I can point out some areas that'll give you an idea of the kinds of expertise we need. And if you're interested in getting involved, um, let me know, let uh, some of our board members or our PAC chairs know, and we'll, we'll uh, work on some ways to, to get you eventually onto a committee. So 
Uh, the report pr produced, uh, published a little over a year ago, about a year and a half ago, from Council Committee One. And the reason we called this a Council Committee is because it wasn't under the guidance of any single um, PAC. It was, it was overseen by all of the PACs, which really created a lot of problems for these folks because they had uh, hundreds and hundreds of comments on their draft documents from all the members of the PACs that they had to, to deal with. So it was a real challenge. And they produced a wonderful uh, updated document on management of exposure to ionizing radiation uh, for, the, for the nation, for the United States. And this was, was primarily uh, called for by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And uh, we expect that in time, some of the, the guidance that was, was put out in this report, which is a little different from current regulations in a few instances, uh, eventually maybe we'll, we'll make it into regulations through the NRC. Uh, we're just gonna have to wait and see on that one. Council Committee 2 is uh, another one that um, is really should be important for Radiation Research Society members. And in fact, one of the co-chairs is a previous RADRES member, uh, our RADRES uh, president, uh, Jackie Williams. And a number of the people on the committee are, are RADRES members. So the idea here was to follow on with this group that had been called WARP. Where are the radiation professionals? And WARP had been a workshop that was held in 2013 to look at the status of the workforce in the various radiation related disciplines in the United States. And they published uh, under the auspices of NCRP this statement, which contained some information and some recommendations on how to, to move forward. So it, a committee was formed at NCRP to, to do a follow up on that. And unfortunately, we've not been successful in getting a federal agency interested in funding this. And so uh, to the great credit of the folks on this committee, they have been um, working independently without funding, working as volunteers very hard to try to prepare a commentary that describes the state of the workforce in the various disciplines within the radiation sciences. So uh, medical physics, health physics, radiation biology, radiation uh, epidemiology, radiochemistry, et cetera, I'm not leaving anybody out intentionally, have all been represented and, and are looking very closely at the state of the, the radiation workforce in each of these disciplines uh, with the, the plan of really being able to document the state of the workforce and then uh, make recommendations as to going forward what needs to be done to uh, augment or uh, whatever is needed with these different disciplines. So to go through some of the PACs that we have, you'll notice here our PAC 1 chaired by uh, Gail Walashek. And this is the PAC that probably has the most Radiation Research Society members that, that belong to the PAC. In fact, I think almost all of these are probably Radiation Research Society members, which makes sense since it's the PAC that talks about radiobiology and epidemiology. And just a few examples of the things they have done or are doing. One of the really important documents that was put out by Scientific Committee 125, the one designated that it was under PAC-1, was to look at 29 epidemiology studies, assess the, the uh, quality of the studies, and then their implications for whether or not that they adhere to the linear non-threshold model. And as many of you know, that, that that's really a big controversy. Um, we, we have good information on higher doses of radiation as to the shapes of the dose response curves for uh, cancer induction or incidence, but we have very little data in the good data in the area where we really need it at very low doses. And it's unclear what's the best model for the extrapolation from the high dose data to the low dose data. Uh, this document looked at, or in this document, the committee looked at, as I said, 29 epidemiology studies, and they reached the conclusion that they're, I've got it here in red, no notably different alternative 
to the LNT model appears to be more practical and prudent for radiation protection purposes. So this was all based on what's the best model to use at this point in time for uh, radiation protection. And the, the decision was to recommend the linear non-threshold model. Going forward, we'll continue to evaluate the data and, and, and see whether or not that, that conclusion holds up and remain uh, open-minded about it. And one of the ways we're continuing to look at that is this other committee that is currently uh, working on developing a report. A number of years ago, we published a commentary to start to look at, at the low dose effects and how we can integrate radiation biology and epidemiology to better assess low dose risk and determine whether or not the linear model, the linear new threshold model is the appropriate thing to use. This commentary made a number of recommendations to further the, the investigations and Scientific Committee 126, ably chaired here by, um, shown here by Julian Preston and Werner Ruhm, have been hard at work developing um, an, an ideas of how we can integrate biology and epidemiology. And their report uh, is currently in, in press. It's being prepared by our, our editor um, to go to the printer. So hang on for something really interesting that's gonna come out in that report, I hope. Another committee that is actively writing right now is a NASA-funded project uh, that we have to look at the sex-specific differences in lung cancer. As many of you would know uh, from, from your studies, if you're, if you're funded by NASA or if you're interested in epidemiology, you know that the uh, atomic bomb studies, the, the lifespan, the LSS lifespan studies from the atomic bomb victims have shown that lung cancer in women is three times more prevalent than it is, is than, in, than in men, as three times greater risk than it is in men. And this has been a real problem for NASA because they use the LSS epidemiology studies as the basis for developing the risk and dose limitations that are applied to the astronaut core. And so uh, they have asked uh, NCRP to look at this very carefully and make recommendations and evaluation and recommendations about uh, what can be, uh, what is the appropriate uh, ways for these models to be done and applied to the astronaut population. So this committee is uh, working very hard, doing lots and lots of webinars at the moment since they can't meet in person. So pack two is the operational radiation safety pack. And I don't mean to downplay them, but I'm gonna go through their work fairly quickly because I know they are, are not um, a, a committee that is uh, so common to, to the kinds of work that Red Res members do. So uh, right now, the main project they have going on is to revise one of the uh, older documents that we had on operational radiation safety program and they're working very hard on this. And if I was giving this talk to the Health Physics Society, I'd spend a long time on this slide, but for Red Res, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just move on quickly. Pack three is our nuclear and radiological uh, security and safety um, pack. And they have been very instrumental in providing guidance for how the symmetry should be done for emergency responders in the event of a nuclear or radiological uh, emergency. And they published a report, developed a report that was published a couple of years ago, and have followed that up with essentially a, a, a boots on the ground implementation document for specific guidance on how to do this, this dosimetry. Uh, this pack continues with the theme of how to do dosimetry, and they're now uh, working on a statement from a new committee that was formed several months ago to look at instrument response verification for uh, radiation emergencies. The problem, we had local and state jurisdictions saying, well, you know, after 9-11, we, we were given money to buy all these radiation detectors and we, we learned how to do nuclear and radiological emergency preparedness, but keeping these detectors working and keep uh, is, is 
or keeping them calibrated is an expensive proposition. And we've not been given money to do that. And so uh, they've come, come to uh, us through CDC and said, can you give us some guidance? What, what can we do to more affordably uh, do uh, calibrations and keep these instruments on, in uh, good working order? And so that's what this committee is working on doing. Very practical, but obviously based in radiation dosimetry and radiation sciences. Pack four, our biggest pack is looking at radiation protection in medicine. And I had mentioned the pie chart at the beginning. And so when this pie chart came out, as I said, everybody was real concerned about the fact that the medicine uh, areas were, were now, uh, particularly uh, computed tomography, CT, now took up almost half of that pie chart for radiation exposures in the United States. So CDC said to us a few years back, let's get an update on that. Let's see if we're doing any better now in controlling some of those radiation exposures. And the answer to that question was published last, uh, late last year in this report, uh, 184. And really a summary of it all is shown in this overview that's available on our website. If you're interested, go look under the, this uh, document um, uh, on the publications portion of the website, and you'll see an, uh, a click on overview, and you can get this summary. And what the summary shows from the, the studies that were done by this uh, group, the scientific committee, is that we have now, uh, in the uh, following 10 years, uh, reduced the average radiation dose from medical exposure in the United States by 15 to 20%. Good news but there's still a long ways to go. And uh, we'll be continuing to monitor that as part of our charge from CDC. PAC-5 is looking at environmental radiation and radioactive waste issues. And um, they have a report that literally was just uh, published, uh, I forget whether it's Friday or Monday that it hit the press, but it is just out. Um, and they're looking at um, norm, uh, naturally occurring uh, radioactive materials, and technologically enhanced norm. And these are really uh, major questions about the radiation exposures that can occur, particularly from T-norm in the oil and gas industry, particularly with fracking. So this is a big question that has come up from all of the states saying, what do we do about radiation protection with all this fracking that's going on uh, within our states. And some states have, have developed guidelines, some have not. There's no federally uh, mandated guidance and there's, there's really a lot of questions about how to proceed. So we have started to look at this with this commentary that makes a lot of recommendations of areas where uh, further follow-up is needed and we're looking at forming a, a, a committee, as soon as we can find funding for it, uh, a committee to look at this in, in great detail and make uh, recommendations that can be used by the states. PAC-6 uh, is looking at radiation measurements and dosimetry. And uh, they have two active committees right now. One of the committees is actually uh, doing work for the Million Person Study for NASA is looking at um, radiation dosimetry for lung dosimetry in medical workers. So part of the million worker study, and I'll show you a list in a minute, is uh, looking at various populations that have been exposed um, to radiation over the, the, the many last year, years. And the medical workers is a very important population for looking at, at the NASA question because half of the workers are women. And many of the, the workers in the million worker study are men because otherwise it's atomic veterans and it's uh, nuclear power plant workers and very heavily males. But this population is really critical because it's got lots of women in it. And so we have a, a dosimetry committee that is assessing, is about, about to have their um, commentary published. Um, it's just being edited right, it just come into editing right now. And we'll be looking at ways to do the dosimetry in these workers and then the committee that was that I mentioned a few minutes ago 
uh, by Mike Weil, we'll be using that with the epidemiology da data that comes out of it as one leg of the recommendations for making or, or evaluation for making recommendations to NASA. We also have a committee looking at um, internally deposited radionuclides in the brain and doing dosimetry for that uh, for our DOE workers who have received a brain dose. And that would also be uh, applicable to NASA for their work um, in, in concerns about the radiation effects on the cognitive and, and CNS effects in the brain. PAC-7, our radiation education, risk and communication, risk communication and outreach, really does everything for helping us advertise NCRP and develop better messages. So they have been uh, helping us develop rollouts to get the message about, out about all our, our various documents. And uh, they are uh, expanding our social media outlet in a lots of ways with Twitter, Facebook posts, uh, developed a social media calendar for us. Uh, we've been working on a quarterly newsletter and we recognize that although there's lots of information on our website, it really needs a refresh and it really needs to, to be expanded to be able to provide more useful information to our stakeholders, including education, uh, educators and researchers and folks like, like you that can use the NCRP website. So here's where we could use some input. If any of you guys have ideas, about um, uh, social media posts we could, could pursue or about things that should be on our website to be available uh, that you could use, please let us know. And if you're interested in, in helping to develop that content, we'd love it, just let us know. So one of the things we do uh, normally do is have annual meetings um, and we have had, uh, for a number of years, we've had two or three radiation research scholars that uh, were funded by the Radiation Research Society uh, in the past to attend the NCRP uh, annual meetings. We're gonna be uh, continuing this under uh, NCRP uh, funding auspices in the future. And some of the topics of our annual meetings uh, in 2019, our annual meeting was on radiation protection in medicine. And the, this is the cover from the uh, program book. This was the publication in Health Physics. Uh, last year, our meeting in 2019, our meeting was in, in recognition of the fact that it was the 90th anniversary since the founding of NCRP's predecessor. Um, and we did a very interactive uh, sessions uh, on answers to uh, pressing questions about radiation in all aspects from emergency response to, to radiation protection in medicine and space and, and so forth. Unfortunately, we had to uh, cancel our meeting this year. Uh, we had a fantastic program that had been planned by Jackie Williams, again, uh, a former Red Res president, and Carrie Zeitlin. And we were gonna look at radiation risks in flight and, and space flight and aviation, general aviation, commercial aviation, uh, um, military aviation. We've made the decision uh, to, pose, to just move that entire program forward to next year. And so that will uh, be our meeting to be held next year um, in um, actually in April, it would have been in uh, March if we'd had it this year. And we're really looking forward to that. All of the speakers have been contacted and have agreed to come next year. So I think that's gonna be a great meeting. You should all put it on your calendars right now. We uh, couldn't do all of the work we do without uh, the partnerships we have with lots of other organizations. This is just listing a, a few of them. Uh, the Image Gently Alliance has been really critical in helping with um, uh, recognizing the doses to children in, uh, from CT in particular and developing approaches to decrease those doses. Um, we work with CRCPD um, on, on uh, areas of, of common interest for state regulations related to radiation uh, exposures, Health Physics Society, and again, RADRES. And some of the things we've done, oh, almost skip one. 
And our international partners are also really important. Uh, UNSCEAR, ICRP, ICRU, ERPA, and we have RADRES, uh, RADRES members too, but uh, NCRP members who are uh, involved in, in all of these organizations and uh, uh, really good uh, partnerships and back and forth between the organizations. RADRES, partnerships, for example, last year, some of you uh, hope attended the uh, NCRP sponsored symposium on uh, the million person study that had eight speakers. Uh, several years before that, we had co-sponsored with um, uh, the uh, CRH, uh, a two-part symposium uh, on radiation biology, epidemiology, and radiation protection. And that was uh, in honor of Bill Morgan. And over the years, there have often been NCRP-related or, or sponsored talks at RADRES members, at RADRES meetings. So we, NCRP has always been an integral part of the RADRES meetings, and we look forward to continuing that. And as I've mentioned several times, we uh, oversee, we, we conduct uh, the million-person study related research. And so the million-person study, it's actually up to, we hope, 1.1 million persons at this point. Um, and it involves individuals who were uh, part of the Manhattan Project, a large number of individuals who um, had worked at DOE facilities over the years, the atomic veterans who were exposed in um, Nevada and, and the uh, Bikini Atoll, um, nuclear utility workers who continue to receive radiation doses, industrial radiographers, um, the Navy has been a big partner with us in looking at um, some of these uh, uh, people in many of these areas, particularly the industrial radiographers and some of the nu uh, nuclear utility workers uh, have, been, have worked at Navy facilities and the Navy uh, submarine uh, uh, personnel are gonna be part of the study going forward at this point. And here's the medical population um, that I mentioned. This is medical workers, not patients, medical workers. And here's uh, again, stressing that a really important part of, of the uh, MPS study, because what we need for uh, addressing NASA's issues is the, the medical workers, because uh, half of this population is, is women. And there are very few women in many of those other uh, populations. So it's been challenging dosimetry. The committee has worked really hard to, to get that uh, dosimetry done. And it's now up to the epidemiology team to, to figure out what that's gonna tell us that we can help with guidance to NASA. So sometimes I get, I've mentioned over and over again, our, our various kinds of um, uh, documents. And one of the things that is really critical for uh, NCRP when we are hired uh, or contracted, given grants from government agencies, is that they realize that we have great expertise in evaluating the science and developing these documents, but we also have very vigorous, very stringent review processes uh, that are much greater than anything any of you have probably ever been through with a journal. So let me tell you a bit about it. Uh, we have these various kinds of, I've mentioned primarily reports and commentaries. We can also, when needed, put out uh, uh, statements, which are very short documents like that warp statement was, and various other kinds of, of procedures, uh, of documents that we do. And we do annual reports. And if any of you are interested in that, the annual reports are freely available on our website. Just go to the NCRP online website and click on annual report, and you'll see the one that was just posted uh, um, about six weeks ago for uh, last year. This is a little bit of a long, I don't know how well you can see this doc, this slide, but essentially it shows you the whole process from when we get an idea or get approached by a government agency that wants us to prepare a, a document. It has to go through approval by our board of directors. We put together a, a, the scientific committee. The scientific committee works and works and works and works to uh, come up with a draft document. The draft document goes to the relevant PAC and it's reviewed by the PAC members. Sometimes, as, as someone will tell you, we recently had over 600 comments from a PAC that went 
on one of the documents that they were reviewing. Then the committee has to address all of those comments, uh, comes up with a revision. The revision now goes to full council. Remember, that's 100 people. Again, there can be hundreds of comments that come back from the council members that have to be uh, addressed, have to be evaluated and addressed as appropriate by making changes in the document. And then uh, eventually it goes into the final editing. Once it's been approved by our council, by our council it goes into the, the publication uh, process. It's a really rigorous uh, approval. If three or more members of council vote to disapprove a report, it's not approved. It's not published. Uh, when, it, when commentaries, it's not quite so stringent. They're only uh, voted on, although they're available for review by the whole council, they're only voted on by the board of directors. But still, at least 11 out of the 13 members of the board have to, to review that. So you all should be really happy that you don't have to go through this intense a review process for papers that you submit to most journals. It's pretty stringent. And that's why uh, NCRP is so highly regarded. So this is, uh, I'm almost done now. Um, NCRP is always looking for volunteers. I stressed at the beginning that we only have 100 members. They each serve for six years. So we don't have a, a, a whole lot of turnover on the main council. And the members are selected based on their experience and their expertise. So sometimes fairly junior individuals might not be appropriate to become members of council until they've got a lot more experience, but those are the kinds of individuals that would be appropriate for some of our scientific committees. And that's where we really can look for individuals who are, are, are younger members of the Radiation Research Society to, to let us know about your interests. And we'll see if we can, when we have slots on new scientific committees, we can bring you on board but we need to get to know you. Uh, you. A good way for that to happen is for you to attend the NCRP annual meeting or make sure you come to us. Uh, get to know um, me, get to know our, our PAC chairs, our board members, uh, other council members, because these are the individuals who select the membership for our PACs and for our scientific committees. So if you're interested, call up me, call up Gail, call up Jackie Williams, call up any of those people that I, I have listed as I've gone through, through these slides or uh, see us at meetings and let us know what you're interested in. So this is pretty much uh, just a summary of all the things I've tried to tell you today. NCRP is chartered but not funded directly by Congress. So all of the work that we do to create these documents on these many, many different kinds of topics are funded by grants and contracts that we have to get from federal agencies and others. And that's also how we fund our annual meetings. Never a registration fee for our annual meeting. Anybody can attend. Uh, and we also uh, have partnerships with numerous other organizations. And in closing, I just wanna thank uh, Rad Rez, obviously for inviting me to do this, but also the NCRP and all its members and all the members of our PACs and scientific committees NCRP wouldn't exist without them. And I hope that I've in, interested some of you a little more in, in NCRP. And uh, I can't believe I finished on time. Thank you very much. Those of you who know me know I never finish on time. So this was a, this was a miracle. Thank you. <laughs> that was great, Dr. Held. Uh, we appreciate all the information and, and you killed it uh, with regards to time. <laughs> Glad we cut that down. Uh, Dr. Walshak, would you yeah, mind? Th uh, thanks, Kathy. Questions? That was really fabulous. I did a great summary of NCRP. I mean, it was really, really interesting. Um, there, there's a question for you from Ed Azam, who first says, thank you, Kathy. And I'm sure that there would have been a lot of applause uh, after your talk, but we, we just can't do it this way. And he asked the question, can you please comment on the nuances between radiation risk assessment and radiation protection? Oh, thanks for your nice comments, Ed. Um, so, so <sighs> we should ask an epidemiology that, an epidemiologist that. I mean, 
radiation risk assessment has to be considered when we look at protection. I guess you could think of protection as being really, uh, in a lot of ways, what the regulatory agencies do when they set dose limits. Uh, NCRP doesn't, as I, as I stressed at one point, we make recommendations about those dose limits, but we don't have the legal authority to, to implement them. That's up to the groups like NIOSH and, and, and uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission and, and EPA, um, depending on whether it's, it's uh, occupational or, or medical or, well, let me take that back, medical workers. Uh, there, are, there aren't dose limits in medicine because you always have to uh, adhere to the ALARA concept as low as reasonably achievable. And I didn't get into all of that. That's, that's really part of radiation protection. And that's based on the a risk assessment, which is in my mind, much more of a, a scientific endeavor, looking at all of the data from the epidemiology studies, the underlying radiation biology mechanisms, the uh, modes of, of how the dosimetry is done and so forth to come up with the best scientific evidence for the risk assessment that is then used to set the, the dose regulations, uh, the dose limits that are regulatory limits. Is that what you had in mind, Ed? Well, I can't answer, but it does sound like it's the perfect answer, Kathy, so thank you. Um, there aren't, aren't any other questions, but I'm gonna take moderator's privilege and ask a question myself. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, where you see the future directions of NCRP going? <laughs> that's a that's a good question. Um, I, I wish I knew. If I had looked at what NCRP was doing, you know, when I first got involved and and um, realized where it's gone now in the last fifteen years, I wouldn't have predicted it. Um, one of the really important things that was recognized those those many years ago uh, and and has been taken advantage of was looking at the need for. Uh, epidemiology and for radiation biology. And obviously I'm, I'm gonna be a really prejudiced answer here, being a biologist. Uh, I think we, we need to really push those ideas. Uh, Ed's question about radiation protection and risk assessment is, it really leads into that. We can't make the knowledgeable um, guidance and setting dose limits and, and for instance, even knowing whether to use a linear no threshold model, whether that really is the best model without a lot more uh, radiation biology uh, mechanistic understanding, without the dosimetry to underlie that, and um, without uh, the epidemiology to, to tie it to, to personnel, to people. Um, I think the other thing that uh, I, I think might become important, but uh, I kind of in some ways hope it's not, but that's emergency preparedness. Um, as COVID has taught us, um, there are certainly gaps in the national emergency preparedness for everything, for many things. I shouldn't say everything. That wasn't very politically correct. For many things. And uh, what we really, uh, when it comes to radiation, and radiological nuclear emergency preparedness, I think we really need uh, to see what we can learn from what's happened in COVID. And I think one of the really critical things that we're seeing now is how do you come out of this emergency? How do you get back towards normal and developing what will be normal? And the same thing is gonna be true after an emergency that is, is radiological or nuclear. We've seen that for example, in, in Fukushima. We saw that in Chernobyl. And, and that's something the United States really needs to address. And I think uh, I'd love to see us be able to get some funding to be able to figure out what lessons have been learned from, from COVID and recovery from COVID that can be uh, applied to help give us guidance uh, in if we should ever uh, need it uh, after a nuclear or radiological emergency. Great, Th thanks Kathy, that was a great answer. Um, there's another question here from Bill Blakely, and the question is, can NCRP have virtual annual meetings? Um, I think we, we certainly could look at more and more organizations that are doing virtual annual meetings. Um, uh, American Cancer Society, uh, um, 
uh, AACR just had, uh, American Association of Cancer Research, just had their big virtual annual meeting. This year, unfortunately, we just didn't have the time to do that for the NCRP meeting because we, we already, our meeting was only about a month uh, out from the time we had to, to make a decision to shut down. We did do our business meeting virtually, but that was only an hour and a half. And that worked very well, much, much to my, my pleasure. I was, I was really worried. Um, but I think we're seeing so many people, so many organizations doing virtual meetings. And I think that could be done um, if we make the decision to do that. I'm not, I think there's a lot of, um, a lot to be gained from face-to-face -face meetings. Um, you know, virtual meetings, webinars can be really, really useful and very informative, but you just don't get the same vibes. You just don't get the same interactions, uh, the same facial features. You guys couldn't see me waving my hands, um, which is, you know, anybody who's listened to me talk, you know, I wave my hands all the time. And I, I think that's important. Uh, that kind of thing gets lost. And so uh, I think um, that there's probably going to be a new normal that's going to be, if that's the phrase you want to use, going to be some mix of uh, virtual meetings and face-to-face -face meetings. I'd, I'd hate to go all virtual. I think face-to-face -face has, has really important uh, uses too. Great. Thanks, Kathy. There's another question uh, from Manuela Buonanno, and she asked, how do you choose the theme of the annual meeting? Uh, good time. question. Good question. Uh, officially, it's selected by the board of directors. Um, but prior to that, um, you know, the president, the board, uh, all solicit ideas from essentially anybody. Um, we we talk to our PACs. We talk to our PAC chairs. Um, you know, I call up people and ask them if they have ideas. Uh, I have to admit, I depend very heavily, or I ha and I know John Boyce did. He was he was president immediately before me. Really depend on the board of directors and and the pack chairs to come up uh, with ideas for us. And I know they get them from talking to other members. And and it's it's essentially a lot of uh, just discussion and sort of some idea rises to the top, and and the board eventually makes the the decision. Great, thanks. So if you have suggestions, Manuela, talk to Gail. And Gail yeah, yeah, please. Me in the board. Um, so, so, Kathy, there's another question from Jan Schumann. Um, thanks, Kathy. Are all reports based on literature review and expertise present, or are you sometimes commissioning studies as well? Uh, by and large, the reports uh, have been based on literature, op open literature and uh, evaluation by, by the knowledgeable members of the committees. Um, we, we now, because of the work being done through the million person study, that epidemiology and dosimetry is, is coming into some of our reports. But by and large, because our mandate uh, for, for NCRP is to really evaluate the scientific knowledge. We put the largest emphasis in most of our reports on, on available literature and an evaluation of, of that literature. Great. Thanks a lot, Kathy. I'm not seeing any other uh, questions come in. Yeah, so, I, think that's, um, I think that's all that we have. Sorry to cut you off there, um, Gail. Uh, but I think that's all we have for today. Uh, do you guys have any closing remarks that you wanted to close out with? I just want to thank Kathy for doing a fabulous job of talking about NCRP and how important the organization is. Um, she really did a good job. Thank you so much, Kathy. Well, thank you. And I just want to thank Rad Res for inviting me to this gives me this opportunity and, and all of you folks for listening. Thanks a bunch. Yeah, thank you guys so much for attending.